<laughs> Almost. T-shirts next. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we usually say at the beginning what 2030 Yay is for people who haven't been before. So we're a small incorporated association in Yay, and we have three main aims. Firstly, to encourage energy efficiency, and you'll remember that terrific presentation by Ron last week. Uh, to increase solar PV and battery uptake in Yay, and to plan for community energy, so energy sharing in Yay as well. So easy to say, easy to say it in three short uh, phrases, but that's a whole lot of work. And um, oh yes, so so far we've been an in incorporated association for just over, well, just under a year, and we've had three major grants. The most exciting one starting, I think, starting next Monday down at the Rec Reserve. So RACV Solar is putting 30 kilowatts of solar PV on the um, the recreation rooms next to the part the pioneer. I next, always get the next, word next to the grandstand. The grandstand, yeah. And footy, the footy rooms. The footy rooms yeah. and 47 a kilowatt hour battery, so oh, backup. Mm -hmm. And then on the netball building, there'll be uh, seven kilowatts and a Tesla power wall. Uh, the reason we were able to obtain this is through a program called Resilience in the Regions, which is really about post-bushfire response. So we argued, well, there was a big bushfire in 2009 and people are still getting over it. And uh, they've been really good and really, really responsive. So one week we actually had the RACV guys come and talk about how you decide what you're going to get if you're going to get solar and battery. And they were terrific as well. And they've been solving a whole lot of little problems. Uh, one was mentioned last week about um, the Pioneer Reserve. They'd always had really, really large electricity bills. Mm. And this guy went into the, electric into the kitchen and found out that underneath the kitchen sink there was a hot water service that had been on for years and just needed <laughs> turning off. So that was one. Uh, we've had this money from uh, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning on climate adaptation. And the third one, oh my goodness, the options paper. The options paper, that's right, which we uh, launched a few weeks ago. So a group called the Community Power Agency, which is sort of an umbrella organisation for community energy groups across Australia, um, did an assessment of yay in terms of uh, resources and responses for what we can do in yay in terms of community energy. So that paper is available online at the 2030 Yay website and you're most welcome to go and download it and read it. So, so the, the um, climate adaptation project um, was funded by DELP and um, as part of the Climate Ready Hume um, program, a Victorian government initiative, um, to support climate change activities and actions. Um, so it wasn't particularly about renewables, but um, how to support and, and promote adapting to climate change. Yeah, so one of the things that's, it, it always happens, we decided we'd, we'd plan this project in line with the Victorian government climate adaptation strategy I'm sorry, my sister keeps ringing me up. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, we've got to the end of the project and now they're changing the strategy, or they're amending the strategy. Um, but there are these wonderful infographics. Do you want to go into those? Yes, let's do that. Um. So. <laughs> What's really interesting about this um, is that they've done some modelling in Hume region to look at what happens when you actually take some, <coughs> some action in terms of climate change and what happens when you don't. So, uh, for example, in these, uh, you can't see it from there, but this says this is a high emissions future, very high emissions future, in Shepparton, Wodonga and Alexandra. So I've written to say, well, what's going to happen in Yay? But so the, 
this is the, the bad line, the brown line, and of course the green line is the go ahead and do some real work in terms of... Um, so if we go to, go to the first page, yep. uh, you just click on this little tab here. Yeah. So this is what happens in climate ready communities if you do, if you don't, or if you do. So the number of days that uh, when the temperature is more than 35 degrees increases and uh, the average rainfall reduces and across time. So uh, the other thing that's, that's interesting then, if we move just to, to slide up, if you want to know what you have to do, then there's a little journey. So from 2020, to 2050, these are the things you have to do. And so when you go onto the climate adaptation pages on our website, you can click on this and read that. And that's for, um, can you go back down, sorry. That's all right. That's for, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, so it's for communities. Uh. <clears throat> Basically it's for communities, for farms, for schools, uh, for homes, and for one other group. But don't worry, it's fine. Okay. Um, but it's a really good infographic for thinking and talking to people about the sorts of things that should be done in order to have fewer high temperature days and uh, more rainfall. So, um the climate adaptation project, we're, we're just about coming to an end uh, with it, <clears throat> with these presentations or workshops. Um, this is, no, as Kerry said, this is number five. There were four parts to um, the project. It kind of grew as we went along. Um, so there's the an uh, online information, we call it the pod, it got that nickname somehow, um, and that's part of the 2030 EA website, just a, a part of it, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. There are these six library workshops that we've been doing. There's some resources for the library. We've been able to buy some books and um, a thermal imaging camera and a power mate, and um, Alistair has donated a light meter also. And then um, with community partners, Chittislow, uh, community House and um, Kerry, local <laughs> hero, um, we've and with uh, out on a limb and Cynthia's here representing out on a limb. We produced three videos, so we'll just go into a bit more about this. Um, so the climate adaptation pod is here, part of the um, website. Do you want to? Walk us through the yeah, website. Yeah, sure. I might, I'll just sit down there. Yeah. Okay. So this is the climate adaptation pod. Yeah. So uh, the, it explains that uh, this was funded by the, the Victorian government. And then this little segment here, the, the little infographic here, explains it's a summary of the strategy. So we looked at this strategy and then we tried to figure out, well, what does that mean in terms of yay? And the other thing that we wanted to do, so instead of saying people should do this, so our climate will not change too much. No, we want to find people who already do terrific things to show really good examples in yay. So moving on from those Can you things. read out what it says underwater? I can't yes. see. Yes, sure. Please. So it's decreasing, uh, just this is the, uh, this is not what to do, it's what happens in terms of water. So decreasing rainfall, increasing temperature and fire weather, increasing floods, and um, wastewater infrastructure is uh, vulnerable that, to disruption. So sewage is vulnerable to disruption. So reduce surface water, increase maintenance and utility costs of built infrastructure, increase fuel and energy costs and disruptions in the energy supply. So okay, this one you've seen, and then just to show you, I think, just to move, to scroll up. Which way? That way? No, the no, other way. Down, down. <laughs> so from the, from the policy, 
the Victorian government policy, we then said, well, these are some things that are relevant to Yay. So each of those then becomes a drop-down menu where you, cl you can click into each of those sections, and here you're going to see a video. Um, there's heaps of heaps of information about that topic. Links, um, suggested books, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So lots to explore yeah. in there. So it really focuses on Yay rather than other places. And uh, but coming, uh, it's a framework from we've taken from the Victorian policy. So um, you can go and have a look at that yeah. on 2030 Yay. I have to pop in and out of the PowerPoint, um, I'm afraid. <clears throat> so the second part of the um, project um, are, are these talks, these, these workshops um, that we've been doing and um, we've got one more next week and then we're going to repeat the, the first one and then we'll see about whether we do another round but probably that'll be it and that'll be um, when we start to tidy up and finish the project. There are also the resources for the library. The, the books were um, came from Christine Cusack with, from her uh, online bookshop in the margins and um, as I said before um, Alastair research, researched and um, purchased on behalf of 2030 Yay the thermal imaging camera and um, power mate and actually donated a light meter to the library and all of those things are you, you can borrow from the library. Claire, can I just say all of those books and others from the library that relate to these topics are on the back table and uh, all of Christine's books for sale are over near the, the, um, the desk. Oh. So then we um, produced the three videos and the first one, and I, um, I just have to go out to get to this, is uh, on regenerative agriculture and we filmed at Tom's Paddock uh, in Glenburn. He's in Glenburn, isn't he? in the natural environment and as an extension of the farm here, um, agriculture. So um, we're here on uh, Tungarong country, which is um, our First Nations people were part of the Kulin Nation. And I guess the history of the land here is that it was stewarded by our First Nations people for you know, tens of thousands of years. And then in around 1860, the first settlers settled this property here. Tom, I believe you've changed your farming practices to regenerative farming. Could you give us uh, an explanation of what you're doing so far? Yeah, regenerative agriculture, to me, means um, actively trying to rebuild the ecological systems in our, in our farming environment. So not just sustaining what we currently have, but actually rebuilding and enhancing. Um, so things like increasing biodiversity, uh, can enrich soil, improve watersheds, and enhance ecological services. That's, there's a lot in that, um, and there are 
some really uh, incredible productivity benefits from doing that economically, environmentally, and also socially. So what we started with here with my grandparents started a, a, um, a cattle breeding operation and they were set stocking in fairly large paddocks across the farm. When my mother took over the property, we then moved to a, a calendar uh, a calendar rotational grazing system, which was really based on the idea that uh, the herd that we had currently needed around two hectares of pasture for around two days. And we didn't deviate from that at all. Every two days they were shifted to a new paddock. What I've learnt over the last kind of 10 years of, of doing uh, holistic uh, planned grazing method is that there's a hell of a lot of nuance to the environment and the more you simplify things uh, the less resilient the system becomes. So now I am actually changing the size of the paddocks to suit the season and also the requirements of the animal and moving much quicker sometimes and much slower at other times. The time component of the grazing is really what I focus on. What role do the cattle play in your farming practices? <laughs> yeah, the cattle are really pivotal in grassland systems. They're the mowers. They get the, the bulk of the material off throughout the year. They process it, produce beautiful meat, and also put that uh, carbon that's been growing through photosynthesis back onto the surface of the soil so that we can feed microbes with them. They're absolutely critical in dry land, uh, brittle environments like we have in Australia. Chukbu is really high nitrogen <coughs> fertilizer. So it's really important to move the chickens rapidly so that it doesn't accumulate under the trailers. Every three days, these chooks are moving to a fresh area. It distributes the manure and we give it a really, really long rest period before they come back to this area. It'll be six months before they come back to this location right here. <laughs> so this is one of the chicken trailers, John. We can, uh, at night, about 450 chickens can huddle into here. You can see there's roosts, which is lovely. That gets them up off the, off the ground. You'll notice there's no flooring here. That's because we really want the chick poo on the soil. So chickens that are out on pasture and are moving regularly are extremely, extremely healthy. I check these chickens regularly for lice, never seen any on them. They don't get any antibiotics, it's just uh, fresh air, sunshine, a really mixed diet of uh, grass and insects and some grain as well and they're just, um, they're just no fuss at all, tricky birds. Regenerative Agriculture course. Do you want to talk a little bit about about that? Um, no. Well, no. <laughs> I, I actually like you to encourage encourage you to come next week and actually see it. What you are going to talk well, about? What we are going to talk about? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to blow my cover now. <laughs> why come back next week? <laughs> what about a, a, but a, it, just a as a quick preview, a, a quick a quick sort of statement. Um, regenerative farming is actually an umbrella that covers lots of different sorts of areas. A lot of people call regenerative farming different things. But the most important thing is, is it's about rebuilding the soil. Um, ever since man developed the plough, 
and turn the ground over, we've been losing carbon out of the soil. And the whole idea of regenerative farming is to put the carbon back into the soil and that builds the resilience of the soil, builds the biology. And as Tom showed, I mean, I'd love to have worms as big as that guy's got on my paddocks. They were not small worms. They were not, and that was just a, a sod that we picked up in the middle of the paddock. It wasn't selected, it wasn't, we didn't dig for half an hour to find that sod. It was the first sod we turned over. Um, that's what regenerative farming does. It builds that biology, it builds that ecosystem. And if you come next week, we'll be showing a video um, of a farmer who's been doing that practice for a while. And we'll also have a Zoom session with uh, Brian from uh, Inside Outside Manager, and he'll be talking about the course that uh, we did over the last, well, ended up being over the last year. It wasn't supposed to be that long, but thanks to COVID it did. So, thank you. And the course, yes. um, it was run by uh, Brian, Brian Warburg from New South Wales, but it's very much on the Alan Savory model. Hmm. Need to move on. So we've gone from the, the big picture um, of, of farming to a community garden in the next one. And it's here. And this is featuring uh, thick bowls, rolls, bowls, <laughs> who is a member of 2030. And, and Cass, Cass in the second <laughs> row is also on. Yeah. We forgot to mention John was in the first one. former coordinator of the community gardens and the compost. We're in front of the community house, the library and the kindergarten in the main street of Yates. We have two different types of garden beds here. We have the wicking bed, which is one I'm sitting on, two behind me. And then we have the corrugated iron beds. These are the original ones that were here. They've been here for about 10 years. This one's basically our herb, herb garden. We've got two bee gardens. So that one over there is our bee garden because because there's no flowering plants around here, there are actually no bees. So we actually had to put in a lot of bee friendly plants to get the bees to come in to pollinate. So we put the deep rooted ones in here, which is what wicking beds are actually good for. They're not good for short, short rooted um, vegetables. The whole idea about wicking bed is it's osmosis, water traveling by osmosis. So down here is the well underneath. There's actually a a description of the wicking beds there. So this is where you put the hose and you just put it in there. It comes out there, that's where you know it's actually full. And basically the deep rooted plants just draw it up as they need it. Raised beds are always good. The problem with raised, they're good for things like your back. Uh, every garden has got a buggered up back. Um, <laughs> and so they're very good for that. The thing with raised beds, you continually have to fill them up. The compost are all used in these beds. And depending on how quickly the turnover is, one of the ideas was that we were actually going to sell the compost to the community to help fund other things for the community garden. As part of the program of the community gardens, we also have a community food table, which is in the foyer of the library outside the community house. The whole idea about the community food table, even though People can actually get any food they want, just come in and pick it off out of the beds or herbs. Um, you, a lot of people actually bring their excess produce from home and put it on the community food table. We do find that when the electricity bill comes in in the quarter, we actually get quite a big demand on the community food table. Um, so it's actually really highly used all the time. It's really fantastic. As I said, the kids go around on the, on the green machine and collect all the buckets. Cassie meets them here and they do the, they put all the buckets in there and they turn it over and make fantastic compost. But when it actually comes to 
the vegetable patches itself, which you, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's community run. So people donate vegetables, people donate their time to water it. Oh, there's a whole variety of compost bins out there. You've got your tumblers, you've got these open air ones, which I actually really like because they turn over the compost really quickly. Um, this was also a community project that we did. Um, you have well, you have the, the grain bins, they're actually quite good. Um, not most people have the grain bins, but this is this one is actually these ones here are actually really good for really um, if you're collecting a whole lot of compost because you, you start from the from the top of the first one yeah. and you turn them over continually until you get down here. And I'd just like to introduce you to Cathy, who's new to the area and she's taking over from me on the community gardens and coordinating the whole thing. So we hope to bring all of her horticultural expertise into uh, running our grain experiment. It's a very exciting project. Well done, Cass. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that little byline uh, tra trailing across the bottom of the screen, but um, on average, on a, in a non-COVID year, four tonnes of food waste a year has been kept out of landfill with this project. Um, the, food, the food waste going into landfill produces methane, and, which is a much more powerful um, greenhouse gas. Yes, how's, how's, how is it going? It's a while since we've talked to you about... It is a little bit patchy at the moment. Um, we're trying to get things back on track. The, the Very Hungry Caterpillar, the bike that the kids use, is still out of action. So oh. they've been running around on the bus, which kind of defeats the environmentally, you know... <laughs> anyway, we're, we're working on getting that sorted out. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're kind of... We've, we've winnowed down to the, to the most keen students who are now involved and uh, we've got a big week coming up uh, Monday. We've got a lot of shifting around of bins and things to do and we're hoping it's because COVID shut basically all of it down um, yeah. last year, uh, it's been a bit difficult to get back into the swing of, you know, and it's been the same for the school as well. So it hasn't been, it wasn't just a difficult year for the composting, it was a difficult year for the kids at school. So they've got routines they're trying to get into there and I'm trying to slot my routine into it as well. So it's a bit of a dance at the moment um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm think we're, I think we're, we're on, just about to get back on track, I reckon. So we're still collecting plenty of food waste. It's just I'm doing most of the composting at the moment rather than the students. So <laughs> <laughs> it's happening, it's happening. So we were really lucky um, that the day we filmed this um, was the day they came back after COVID. Mm. Uh, so it was fortunate timing. Um, and the last video we've got is um, uh, where we visited Kerry and Peter Tull's home and Tim Forsey um, conducted an energy audit uh, and he has a great Facebook page called My Efficient Electric Home where you can ask any question and people will answer um, anything to do with um, renewables or uh, increasing energy efficiency, reducing costs, your, your bills, or anything, basically. researcher, writer, social media influencer, and a qualified home energy consultant. What we're here to do today is a home energy consultation at this home not too far outside of Yay, Victoria. What a home energy consultation involves is looking at aspects of the house 
from an uh, energy and comfort point of view, and then sitting down with the homeowner to discuss ways that possibly the home could be improved to reduce energy bills, reduce environmental impact, and to make the home more comfortable. But in addition, what we're also going to be doing is demonstrating the use of the Residential Efficiency Scorecard. This is a computer-based tool that's been put together and administered by the Victorian government, which gives us a way to rate Victorian homes on a scale from 1 to 10 stars. The scorecard assesses the cost of operating the heating and cooling systems for a home to a, a reasonable level of comfort, also uh, considers the cost of the hot water services, pools and spas, aspects of lighting, and also takes credit for solar PV panels should you have any of those on the roof. And with this house, we will put information in and find out where it rates on that 1 to 10 star rating. But also with that tool, what you can do is to test the value of improvements and upgrades. So is it possible to make changes to this home where we could increase the star rating, say, by one star, if it's not already at that perfect 10? Good afternoon. G'day, I'm Tim Forsey. I'm here to do a home energy console. Well, thank you, Peter Tull. Good to meet you. My wife, Kerry. Hi, Kerry. How are you? I'm Tim. Good well, to see you. you. You've got a beautiful home here. It'd be interesting to uh, look at it from an energy point of view. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so what's involved with the home energy consultation? What in the home are we actually going to look at? Well, it can be a pretty long list, and your consultant might be there for a few hours. So we're going to look at how well sealed are the doors and windows. We're going to look at the insulation in the roof space or under the floor. We're going to test shower heads. We're going to look at the energy bills, gas and electricity, what goes on from month to month in the home. There's a long list of things that we could check uh, during a home energy consultation. So Tim, tell me, what can we do about our power bill? Yeah, these are big electricity bills, and unfortunately, with a normal electricity bill, all you can see here is your monthly usage. But these days, thanks to the smart meter, there are ways that you can get much better information about your electricity use on a daily basis, hourly basis, or even instantaneously. So that's the sort of information that homeowners should have so they can really figure out what's going on with their energy bill. This house is not that old, and it's been built to a good standard with respect to the thermal envelope. But what does that mean? It means it's got good insulation in the walls, there's insulation under the floor, there'll be good insulation in the roof space, the windows are double glazed, and you see some other features such as the blinds that are useful for keeping out the sun's heat in the summertime. Here we are on the north facing deck of this property. The house is designed to have an excellent northerly aspect, so there's going to be a lot of winter sun uh, available to this home for uh, heating up the house. And also on the north facing roof we have a efficient evacuated tube solar thermal hot water system and also there's a lot of a north facing roof space for 